Hey, History 101 people, how you doing? I don't know when you're watching it. I hope you're watching it on this nice sunny day, but I'm taping this at the end of, I don't know what, it's like five or six days of rain here. I'm hoping that pretty soon that rain is going to disappear and we get some nice sunshine here. I really appreciate you guys hanging out uh, with me in this way. <laughs> I'm not sure how many are hanging out with me, but for all of those of you who stuck it through and watched all the tapes, thanks so much. You know, I'm sorry about some of the quality issues. I want you guys to know this is a you know, one-shot thing. There's no such thing as second take. I just I turn on the camera and do it, and then I'm done, of course. And it's a humbling experience to get to see yourself on tape in this particular kind of way. I realize that I'm really a bad guitarist and not a very good singer, but I also want you to know that my voice has just not really been perfect. <laughs> okay, never mind. I've got a crappy voice. I might as well not lie to you guys. It doesn't make any sense, too. Um, I'm, I'm entering the last section. This is the last thing that I'm going to kind of really put, present to you guys. I realize in some ways I've kind of cheated you. I think I've overspent my balance of time as far as uh, History 101 is concerned. And for those that have paid, you know, you're stuck with me, I, I can't tell you how much I do really do appreciate this. But anyway, we are now going to venture into the last and significant um, issues associated with History 101. And um, I'm going to start like this. At about 4 o'clock in the morning on April the, uh, so it says here, April the 12th, 1861, a man by the name of Edmund Ruffin fired a cannon. Edmund Ruffin. My finger's on his name. Edmund Ruffin fired a cannon. He fired a cannon that was located in the general area of uh, Charleston Harbor there in South Carolina. And the cannon was aimed at a, a f federal facility called Fort Sumter. It does that around 4 or 4.30 in the morning on April the 12th, of course, and it begins, it's a, a day-long bombardment that occurred, basically, that occurred during that day, and indeed, uh, you know, intriguingly, you know, I, I'm not sure it's absolutely true, but, you know, the, the saying used to be that, you know, it was the bloodless beginning for the bloodiest war in American history. From that, from that cannon shot, that, that moment, you know, becomes the Civil War of America, this extraordinary rending of our nation, leading to the deaths of perhaps as many as 750,000 Americans, of course, you know, this tremendous physical damage, um, carnage of the individuals who died there, uh, of course, you know, the psychic damage that will be associated with warfare. You know, all of this is going to begin with Edmund Ruffin's shot. Edmund Ruffin was what they call a, a Southern fire eater. He was a Southern advocate of, of disunion. He wanted the, the South to secede. He'd been t talking about that since really since the 18, really about 1850. And of course, you know, he was then given the honor of firing the shot. And I always like to let you know that he fired another shot. I don't know what else he did during the war, to be honest with you. Is there, uh, man in his mid, mid to late 50s, but at the very end of the war, you know, instead of being able to just to submit to a, a, a northern-controlled Yankee Union, he, he put a bullet in his head, you know, so he committed suicide. I don't imagine that there were many people who did that. There were some probably did, and there were other Southerners who simply fled the nation, went to South America and stuff like that, but Evan Ruffin, you know, fires the shot that begins the Civil War, and, and at the end of the Civil War, fired a shot that ended his own life, and because he just couldn't continue, didn't, didn't wish to continue. Um, in, in the United States of America. Now, what I want to do is my last section, you know, and it's within the general confines, of course, of antebellum America, which I had suggested to you, of course, is this last major area. And, you know, there were three developments I want to highlight for you guys in antebellum America. The first one was the dynamic growth of America, which was really critical at that period. The second was the increased uh, differences between the North and South, of course, the house divided that began to develop. And, you know, the third thing then was what we call the sectional crisis. So what that means is that, you know, this is when the divisions between the North and the South become increasingly problematic and will ultimately then lead to the, the catastrophic development of the Civil War itself. Now, um, so really what I'm going to do for you guys, and this is the essential thing, is to explain to you the causes of the Civil War. You know, that be, you know, it's within the context of the sexual crisis, but really the issue that I want you to be aware of, you know, what caused the Civil War. And I've already kind of given you some hints about what's going to cause the Civil War, but here I want to try to put it all together in a hopefully, you know, relatively decent package for you. So whenever I confront any kind of issue of causation, I'm always going to use the same, the same analysis as causational analysis, and it always starts with these two things, and it has to do with structures and events. Structures create the latent situation that will ultimately lead to, to the catastrophic outcome, and, you know, so... Um, if a person is a smoker, of course, you know, that creates a structural situation that might lead to the catastrophic outcome of that person getting cancer or something like that, you know. 
So um, in st the structures are like the faults that underlie California. They're sitting there, of course. They're latent. But of course, if they move or anything like that, if there is an event, then you know we're, we're going to have some serious issues associated with it. It's just the way that I see things happening. You look at the structural, the latent components of a situation, and then, you know, they're, so they're the known thing. You can actually, you know, the Americans would have known all this stuff as they're going through this period, this late antebellum period. They would have been able to see these things, and you could argue that they could have dealt with them. They could have maybe confronted these particular issues. You know, they don't, effectively, but, you know, they could have. So the structures are sort of the latent, they're sitting there laying there, the, the known components. And then into that comes a series of events. And the events are the things where, you know, you can't e exactly explain what's going to happen. It just kind of happens, uh, and, and things, you know, will ultimately kind of, you know, begin to come out of control. To be honest with you, the sectional crisis is the event sequence. You know, one thing after another leading to, or just leading to this kind of this, uh, um, dialectic kind of a crisis that will ultimately take us all the way to the Civil War. So I want to explain first the structural components that will lead to, you know, create the foundation for the potential for the Civil War and then the events which will ultimately take us to actual conflict to that April day uh, that when Edmund Martin fired that camera. So let's start with the structural components of the situation. And these are the long-term developmental parts uh, of the American situation that will create the foundation for the Civil War. And the first thing I'm going to put in here, and this is the least important, but I want to mention it, I'm going to call it fanaticism. So fanaticism is simply that the presence of individuals who are like stirring the pot of conflict you know, I always feel like there were people like this, in, in not so much in my life generally, but like in my educational career. Especially I remember them in elementary school and uh, junior high school and high school. And these are the guys who kind of wanted there to be a conflict. You know, when there was like the potential for a fight, they wanted to make sure that there was going to be a fight. And we had a kid named John McFadden. I guess still remember his name, and he was like the chief instigator, you know. I always hoped that he went on to be a fight promoter because it seemed like that was his, his particular thing. But, you know, there were those Americans who simply saw the, the coming of a conflict, you know, as a good thing, as a, as a really good thing. In the South, they were the so-called Southern Fire Eaters. This is Edmund Ruffin and uh, Barnwell Red and William Anstey, a number of individuals who simply were just very aggressive in promoting the idea that the South should leave the Union. Those voices become louder, more strident, more vitriolic, as, and they're called Fire Eaters because every time they open their mouth, they're like, fire and brimstone's going to come out. In the North, though, there's the equivalence, the abolitionists, right? i got to tell you, uh, William Lloyd Garrison was happy as hell on the day, that, on Fort, the day of Fort Sumter, you know. He thought, finally, here's the war that will end slavery, you know. So you have on both sides kind of a fanaticism component, which is stirring the pot and instigating the conflict. I put it way down on the level, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go upward in terms of what's important here. And if I was listening to this, you know, physically, you know, this is the least important of the things. But it's, you know, it's, it's notable. We want to know that we want to know that there were fanatics and they were stirring the pot as best they possibly could. Much more powerful are the larger developmental issues, you know, the, the largest things, the larger structural issues. And one of the critical ones that I've highlighted for you guys is the dynamic growth of America. Now, there's a number of outcomes here, but the one that I kind of want to emphasize at this moment it's like it's the nation is growing so rapidly that it, that kind of growth became somewhat overwhelming. I, I fear I use human analogies way too much, but let's just do it here if you don't mind. It's like the antebellum period was Americans being a teen, American nation as a teenager. When you're a teenager, of course, you're undergoing incredible growth that can take place, and it's hormonal explosion and pimples popping out, and you know, and your brain going kind of crazy. To be honest with you, you know, there's, there's a sense that you. You know, as an adult, a rational adult, you really can't reason with a 13-year-old, you know, because they're just in a state at that moment, at that moment where, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to make sense of the, of the situation. Um, you know, when you're in that, in that period of growth, you know, it's been one of the tragedies of my life that I, I was aware of. How many, well, two suicides for sure, two teenage suicides for sure. Uh, one was my best friend's brother, older brother, he committed suicide when he was 15. Uh, another was just a kid that, you know, we tragically just kind of walked down the street at the moment the mom came home and the garage door went up and this 13 year old boy was hanging and you know it was weird I, I felt like I had to go do something and I walked forward and I forgot that my, I, my Katie was on my shoulders my little daughter you know and luckily other people were pulling up to help at that moment so I just but this you know, and I read later on of course that the kid he was he just he went to the local middle school and thing you know, got you know and it just seems so strange sad to me you know that I, I think they don't quite understand you know, you know the finality of the act you know they think maybe it's just a, a moan of high drama or something like that but 
when you're a teenager, you're going so rapidly and changing so quickly that it's hard to deal with everything. And that's, I guess, my point. The United States is growing rapidly that it might be, you know, it's dislocating to some degree and it means that they may not be able to deal with all the other issues that are taking place. But I think the dynamic growth does have kind of an impact that will lead us and dislocate the situation and lead us to the, you know, the structural, uh, act, structural situation that will lead us towards the Civil War. Okay. Now, the dynamic growth definitely had one particular result which becomes critical, which is the last one I've been dealing with, and these are the differences between the North and the South. I use my road analogy for you guys. The North is going one way, the South is staying on the same road, but the North is di diverging away from that road. And you know, you can be different. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but if there are issues between the, you know, these two entities that become deal breakers, and of course, ultimately, the deal breaker issue is, is slavery, you know, then you know, this can be really problematic. So North was heading off, and it, it is kind of like there are two different nations in the United States in 1815. The Northerners and the Southerners are really increasingly seeing each other as the other, and not as one as part of the same nation. So this is a critical factor that will lead us ultimately to the Civil War. And as I mentioned, this is quite a long time ago, but I, I did tell you about the constitutional ambiguities issue, the issue of states' rights. And the states' rights issue, of course, will ultimately lead the state of South Carolina to believe it, it was its, the right of that state to leave the Union. You know, and of course, that's their interpretation of the Constitution. Now, one of my interests, you know, something I've always wondered about, is let's just say that that wasn't quite, that, that was clear, you know, that wasn't an ambiguity in the Constitution. Would that have kept South Carolina from leaving anyway? And, and you, can, you, know, you know, I can't tell you, I don't, I don't even know, but because of the ambiguous nature of the Constitution, in terms of states' rights, South Carolina and other southern states did believe they, were, they had the right to leave the Union, and thus it becomes, you know, one of our structural uh, developments that is leading us towards the, towards the Civil War, okay? Now, the final cause, of course, the structural cause, and it's, you know, ultimately sort of the most important, in my mind, it is the most important thing. It had been there from the very beginning of the American experience in 1619, of course. You know, it had become a component, a powerful component of the economy, especially of the South. It became increasingly, over time, ingrained in the social apparatus and the political apparatus of, you know, to, to a degree the nation, and, but primarily of the South, of course. It was upheld absolutely by the Constitution. It was supported by the Constitutions of, in a very overt way of a number of, uh, of the Southern states, of course. You know, uh, anyway, just in, in a powerful elite of Southerners, of course. You know, they, they were the primary supporters and sustainers of this. You know, you know what is the ultimate, uh, the seminal cause? Let's call it the seminal cause of, of the Civil War, and of course, it is slavery. You know, when I was preparing for my PhD comps, I thought to myself, okay, what if the question is, you know, what caused the Civil War? Which is a common question in, in a PhD comp a comprehensive exam. And my, my thought that I wanted to do is, you know, I would simply on the first page just write in big bold letters, you know, slavery, exclamation point, you know, and then pretend like that's the end of the game. But of course I knew that they'd want all the other information, so that would start on page two and I'd give them all of that. But Slavery is the seminal cause of the Civil War, no doubt about that. And what's so weird is, you know, when they go to war, they don't talk about slavery necessarily, but it is, it's the issue. And, you know, the reason I say that is because, you know, if you take slavery out of the equation, is there going to be a war? You know, is there going to be a problem in the same kind of way? And I, I don't think so. I can't, I can't quite put that together to lead that to some kind of a war. But with slavery, you have this, you know, this issue that they cannot deal with, I mean, they, they cannot overcome, and it becomes then the seminal cause of the Civil War. So. We've got the fanaticism, uh, we've got the um, dynamic growth of America, we've got the differences between the South, we've got the constitutional ambiguities, we've got slavery, we've got a lot of problems there, of course, that are going to ultimately uh, formulate themselves into creating the foundation of what could be a catastrophic outcome, no doubt about that. But you know, you still have to have, you know, when the latent things just sort of sit there, you know, like an, a fault line just sits there. It doesn't, it, there's a, I think right where I'm standing right now, we are probably 500 yards from the San Jacinto Fault. When we purchased the house, the, um, the um, realtor said I was supposed to read, as I'm signing off and everything, she says, you need to read these two pamphlets. And she didn't put them in my hand, she put them over on a chair. And I, you know, I thought that was an interesting thing, and I, I paid no attention. And I came back later, I, you know, she had presented them to me, I guess that's the point, you know, she had legally obligated to present them to me. And I'm looking at them, and one of them said, it's your fault. And which I thought was a really kind of catchy little title, but the what they were trying to tell me, they had to inform me that I, my house was located relatively quick, close to a, a major fault, you know, but she did it in that kind of, 
interesting way where I didn't quite catch exactly what was happening and she didn't put them in my hand at that particular kind of moment. I always thought that was funny. You gotta read these over here, you know, but not, not handing them to me. You know, the structures are there, they're, they're latent basically, but something has to come along to kind of make it all happen and what has to come along are events. And we see, we see events begin to generate. This is what's going to create the, the crisis, you know, the actual crisis itself, uh, where the latent situations begin to kind of get out of hand. Crisis by definition, of course, you know, is indeed something that is out of control, and we see the nation increasingly becoming out of control relative to the problems between the North and the South. Now, I would argue the primary, <laughs> this is structural, <laughs> so I, I just, I, I get, all of a sudden, this is a structural issue. But I'm going to call this politicization of slavery was the big deal. By the time we get to the 1850s, and, and well, here's the thing I wanted to tell you. It's like every politician in America wanted to avoid slavery. The northern politicians did. The southern politicians did. Because they knew that whenever slavery would come up, it becomes just so incredibly divisive. So the whole idea was to ignore it. In many ways, I kind of see it as similar to today, where most politicians would really love it if they didn't have to talk about abortion. Because when you talk about abortion, you're pretty you're almost always going to piss off half the crowd, you know. You get the anti-abortion people over here; they're going to be pissed off if you don't. If you're pro-choice, and the pro-choice going to be pissed off if you're anti-abortion. And there's not a lot of middle ground there. You know? It's the same kind of situation it was with slavery. So the politicization of slavery. So that means that slavery begins to enter the political arena in ways that no one really wanted it to. I got to tell you, in the 1830s, there was actually this kind of gag order which they tried to inhibit any kind of anti-slavery abolitionist petitions from getting the Congress. And by the way, that's a violation of the, of the Constitution, of the Bill of Rights, the right to petition. And yet the politicians said, no, we don't want to talk about it. It's, it's too troubling. It's too messed up. But, you know, in, in the end, they couldn't avoid it. You know? Slavery was going to become politicized. And when something becomes politicized, you know, it becomes increasingly entering into the, re the realm of like emotions and stuff like that. You can think of almost all these issues that could be dealt with rationally, like abortion. I mean, there are rational ways of confronting that issue, that, but it becomes politicized, you know. And then, of course, everything gets everything becomes more vitriolic and hostile, and you know, you're not going to get any kind of solution there. Issues of immigration, of course, it's best dealt with in a rational way. But if all of a sudden you start screaming that you know Mexicans are rapers and murder, you know, you're politicizing it. You're increasing, you know, you're, you're, you're disallowing kind of the rational confrontation of the issue and problems associated with, with uh, immigration. So politicization often is a bad thing. You know, it enters the political arena, politicians play with it, of course, or play on it, and all of a sudden, of course, you know, things get out of hand in a fairly significant kind of way. So the thing that happened in the sectional crisis, what I'll just call it the politicization of slavery, you know, that slavery became increasingly a political issue. And it did so because of a fundamental issue of America, develop, developmental issue of America. And that is westward expansion. All through the antebellum period, as I told you, Americans are moving to the west. And every time they moved to the west, they had to you know, determine the nature of the area that they were going to settle. And the fundamental question that they had to ask, of course, was will there be slavery or will there not be slavery? Uh, there's been, this has been called like the, the disembodied slave and the uninhabitable land problem. That, you know, no one necessarily knew if there could be slaves like in New Mexico, but it was always going to be the issue, you know. And because both sides were standing firmer on their side, that one side didn't want slavery, the other side wanted slavery, you know, they're going to start fighting over this thing, even though it may not even be a place where there could be slavery. Of course, it's a really dumb thing when you think about it. Just because you can't grow cotton someplace doesn't necessarily mean you can't have slaves, you know, like some other, you know, utilization of the slaves or something. But still, I mean, that's the way that their perspective was kind of limited, you know. Can you go caught and could you have slaves there? Yes or no, kind of. Anyway, um, the, the politicized issue, you know, was slavery in the territories. As every new area came in, they had to deal with the issue. Is it slave or is it free? And every time they dealt with it, it was more, it was more politicized, it was more volatile, more emotional, more drama. You know, all these things begin to crank up, basically. And, and so this becomes uh, what creates the event dynamic, the event dialectic that's leading us uh, to the uh, Civil War. So I'm going to relatively quickly go through these events that will kind of uh, take us, uh, and, you know, some of them are a little outside of the I haven't I suggest you the sectional crisis, you know, is beginning in the 50s. That's when it intensifies. But you can actually say the you know, politicization of slavery started much earlier. So I'm going to start by telling you the story of the Missouri Compromise of 1820. This is the, f it isn't exactly the first time this came up, but, it, you know, where it really begins to kind of manifest it. The issue of kind of slavery in the West, slavery in the territories, and and then, all, and the, then the politicization, that's the critical kind of factor that we have to kind of highlight. So the whole issue deals with 
the admission of the state of Missouri. I know that it's often difficult to see this. Turn, I didn't turn my lights on, sorry. Let me get them on real quick. Not that they help that much. And let's kind of cruise in a little bit on the map. Okay, let's get that one. Okay, so uh, in 1819, Missouri, the territory of Missouri, wanted to come in. You can see it here, it's in this burnt orange right here. Missouri wanted to come in to be, and be admitted as a state of the United States of America. And it wanted to be admitted as a slave state, as a slave state. Now, you know, other slave states have been admitted, so it doesn't seem like it's uh, that big of an issue, but it, it is, it was. And the reason is a couple of things that are going on here. One is that at that moment, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states. And if another slave state came in, that's creating kind of a balance, and of course they're trying to be as equal as they can in the situation. If Missouri came in, of course, it would create an imbalance where Missouri would have, or the slaves, there would be more slave states than there would be free states. So that was kind of an issue. But one of the larger issues was how far north Missouri went. If you look at that, so here is, this is Ohio, and I'm going through Indiana, and I'm going through Illinois, you know, and here I get it, Missouri. So, you know, you're not going south to get into a slave state, you're going straight east to get in a slave state. And so many northerners were like, whoa, what the hell, you know, slavery coming so far to the north, this doesn't seem like the way that this should, this should, this should, we should be proceeding. So this became an issue, you know, and the divisions were not on party lines. The divisions that began to develop were on sectional lines. The northerners are pr promoting, of course, and, or they don't want Missouri to come in like this, and the southerners, of course, very much want to. And you, It's the first time you get this moment of kind of high drama politics where people are really beginning to, you know, see this sectional di division manifesting. And, you know, in the moment, of course, of the debates, it became increasingly emotional and problematic. But the whole issue is that they will compromise. I mean, that's the point I'm trying to make. So they, you know, they came up with what they, with a way to solve this. And they're gonna come with the Missouri Compromise. Let me just tell you what they did. And, you know, at that moment, they thought this was a really good idea. We're gonna fix this sucker. So they decided that they, at the same time that they would admit Missouri, they would admit Maine. Maine had been part, actually, of Massachusetts, but it would now come in as an independent state. And thus, you know, you re recreate the balance, uh, you know, 12 free states, 12 slave states. And then the other part, and this was arbitrary, but they hoped, you know, kind of enduring, was that they would create a line. In the, it's called the Missouri Compromise Line. So the line would have pretty much out of the, on the southern border of Missouri. And the line at that time would just stretch across to the boundary of the Louisiana Purchase. But the idea was that, you know, there, there wouldn't be, there could be slavery below it, but there wouldn't be slavery above it. And it was arbitrary, but they, they liked the idea that it was kind of final. You know, we're not going to have to fight that out anymore. If it's south of the line, slavery. If it's north of the line, we're going to go ahead and, you know, say that that is runway. That that's going to be the free area. And, you know, that seemed like they were, they were they're solving the problem. But as you can imagine, you know, that, you know things are going to happen. People continue to move to the west, and, and we see more and more areas that become under settlement, of course, ultimately seeking admission into the nation. And by the time it gets to 1850, there's just a whole bunch of issues that are sort of sectional issues that are coming into play. I'm going to focus on the issue of California, because California, by 1850, was asking to be admitted into the Union because of the gold rush, and so many people would come to California. And California was asking to be admitted as a slave state. Which, damn it, I say slave state. As a free state. Of course it wasn't going to be a slave state. It was going to be asked to be admitted as a free state. Now, one of the things that you might note is that California has a very significant portion which is south of the Missouri Compromise Line. So, and you know, that, i got to tell you, when the Missouri Compromise Line was extended, it only went to a boundary. But the, then we make an assumption, of course, it would extend all the way to the coast, which you have, like, the Mexican Session. So part of California would be uh, on the line. So this becomes, you know, a, kind of an issue of debate between the North and the South. But th there were other things going on at that time, too. There was the slave trade that took place in Washington, D.C., and, you know, it was a very alarming to the Northerners and to the abolitionists. And you could walk down the street in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, and find a slave, slave market, you know, where slaves are being uh, sold. There were issues of fugitive slaves. The Northerners were being a little more helpful to those slaves that were running away. You know, the abolitionists wanted to help them. And the Southerners really felt that this is a violation of the Constitution. And they wanted, of course, the government to kind of step in and say, no, you gotta, you know, we, we need to get those slaves back, and everyone's going to have to help us there. There were issues associated with Texas, especially Texas boundaries. And what was going to be the size of Texas? You know? what, how would they pay the, the Texas debt? That, that's coming into play, too. And then the organization of, the, of the New Mexico Territory. What's going to happen there? You know, is that going to be free? Is that going to be? Slave? And all these things are kind of coming together. And when it entered into the political arena in Congress, I mean, it became a moment of extraordinary drama. You know, how, 
high drama and anger between Northerners and Southerners because the North had their side of the equation. They wanted to happen, and then, of course the Southerners had theirs. And we have Daniel Webster's, you know, and people trying to make peace with them and trying to figure out some way out of this. And Daniel Webster rises up one day and says, you know, I stand before you not as a Massachusetts man or a Northern man, but as an American man. You know, trying to bring people together if possibly could. They tried to create a big bill that would solve all the problems and put it through, and they found out that it just simply wouldn't work. And, and so up steps, you know, 